the recovery that you know, self can't get out of self. But self, to me, represents a mental system, not just the body. That's its flagpole, so to speak, the identification with the body, but it's a mental system <sighs> called self-centeredness. And it's a way of interpreting life. Life gets interpreted from that point of view. Everything is looked at as how it pertains to you. Yeah. And in that selfing, what occurs is the mental realm is the dominant space. Yeah. And after a while, what predominates your life or this life is a mental experience. Yeah. And a mental experience is thinking. Thinking about, thinking about feelings, thinking about time, thinking about the body, thinking about this, thinking about that. And it has a physical effect, obviously. You feel something. Sometimes it generates feelings. But it's usually not really uh, apropos to what's happening now. It tends to be off. Yeah? It's not really, its main thrust of its experience is in conscious contact. It's, it's its own agenda. So it actually says no to this moment, and it says yes to thinking about another moment. Yeah. Or even when it sees this moment, it only sees this moment in comparing it, comparison to another moment from the past. Now this system, this selfing, its flagpole is that feeling of being a long and lasting, independent, separate entity. It's truly rooted in body identification. Yeah. Truly rooted there. But its experience has very little to do with the body. Even if you see a lot of people who seem to be totally in their body, many of them are not in their body at all. They're in the concept of their body. They're in their body image up here. It has very little to do with really being in the body. They're just obsessed with an image of it, a mental image. Yeah. So they've even tested it that, let's say women who have anorexia, if they give them a little thing to measure their biceps, yeah, when they measure it, they always measure it larger than it actually is. Because in their mind's eye, in this mental realm, they're seeing themselves as fat, literally. Obviously, if you saw them, you would say they're super skinny, but in their seeing in the mental realm, they're fat. Yeah. And so their mental experience is that I'm fat and i got to lose weight. <laughs> yeah, that's insane, isn't it? But it, does it, it can override the physical condition or the, or the quote-unquote facts here very easily. It's like a minor speed bump. It just goes up into the realm. And in that realm it can entertain what's not happening. And it can entertain about what happened, which isn't happening anymore. And in that entertaining, it leaves the realm of conscious contact and it goes into the mental realm of thinking about conscious contact. And it's very, very easy because the first thing you do when now you have conscious contact, the first thing the mind does when you see something and you hear something and you feel something and you taste touch something and you smell something is it says, I saw it. I heard it. I felt it. I tasted it. I touched it. It immediately presents a mental image of who's hearing it, who's seeing, who's feeling, who's tasting, and who's touching. But it goes totally contrary to the facts because you can see a dead body and if you took that eye out and put it into a live body, that eye would see again. But it's not seeing in a dead body. So the machinery of the eye is perfectly in place, but there's got to be something there to allow seeing to occur. And it's not the body, it's consciousness. Yeah? So now, the expression of consciousness, which is conscious of this, seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, touching, immediately gets claimed by the mental process that I am seeing. And that I is a mental product. 
the sense of being you is a mental product produced by this mental process. It produces a sense of being a you, but that you is a thought, literally, comprised by many other thoughts about that initial thought. Yeah? And so, let's say something's going on, and I see something, the scene of something. Let me, let's say I see an ex-girlfriend. So there's the seeing, but that's totally forgotten. What happens is if there's the Paul that's seeing the ex-girlfriend, that seeing her downloads a lot of files about her. Yes? And a lot of files about me. And a lot of files about what it means to be seeing her. What it doesn't mean not to be seeing her. What is it going to lead to? Yada, 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 yada. Tons of files come up. Seeing her isn't what produced the files to come up. You seeing her produced the files to come up. Yeah? Seeing her is an event. That's, that happened. But you seeing her is an interpretation of that event. Based on what? Self-centeredness. So the seeing her now is just reflecting back the center of all seeing, which is you as the seer. You as the hearer, you as the feeler, you as the taster, you as the toucher, and you as the thinker. So now the you sees the ex-girlfriend, and all these files come up, and before you had absolutely no feeling, suddenly you feel super uncomfortable. And maybe a desire comes up that you want her. Maybe a story about how much you've missed her. Maybe it, you look at your, your, your uh, contemporary girlfriend, and you find fault in her immediately. Yeah. All of this stuff goes off. Yeah? And what happens is you're having a mental experience. You're, you're now living in the mental realm. There was, there's the seeing of her, but now that has totally been forgotten, and the thinking about what it means and what it doesn't mean becomes paramount. This is called the addiction or the obsession with self. And the thought begets another thought, and another thought, and another thought, and another thought. Now, that event leaves, but you the rest of the day are thinking about it. So the rest of the day, other seeings and hearings and feelings and tastings and touchings are going on, but they're overridden by your thinking, by not your... See, it's not you thinking. By the thinking about what it meant to see her earlier in the day. <laughs> So for all intents and purposes, you're now totally, totally up to self's ass. You're totally in a mental realm. And after a while, if you keep frequenting that, you'll forget what it's like to be alive, literally. But you'll have thousands of thoughts what it means to be alive. Thousands and thousands of thoughts and feelings and opinions you'll have about life, but you won't really be feeling the living of it, which is conscious contact. You'll be unconscious to that, but you'll be hyper-conscious to the thoughts about you. So now, we're in a mental realm, and this is where the playing God occurs, truly. This is where the mental process starts playing God. Its initial playing God is it denies what's happening as being really of no value and puts extreme value on what's not happening, be it that way or that way, past or future. And now it dwells much more in there, and it really doesn't give a damn about this moment. So it's basically saying, fuck you to this, and I'm going to go here where God, I can play God. Yeah? And that God is going to be self. And in that mental realm, you can entertain an idea of God in that mental realm, but it's also a product of the mental realm. It's purely conceptual. Maybe you'll pray to it to get a parking space next week at a busy meeting or something, yes? Or whatever. But it's, you have no idea of its own nature because you've just framed it from the self's point of view. So the self now has given God its meaning which is going to be a lesser God than it every time. Literally. 
that God is never going to override this God that made it. Yeah. So it's playing God. So you wake up in the morning and it tells you how the day is going to be. You haven't even gotten vertical yet. You know, horizontal, but it's always, all, it's like a crazy weatherman just predicting storms every day. And you're just tuned to that little cable channel and you just can't seem to break away from it. And what it really does, I feel in a way, the mental realm, what it does for it to seem real, it needs something very valuable of yours, which is attention. For it to appear real, you must be an attentive audience to it. Because if not, you'll be captured by this, what's actually happening. Because why? It's happening. <laughs> I mean, it's, pretty, it's a very pretty easy thing because it's happening. This has to have an incredible strategy because it's not actually happening. And it has to override what's happening and, and give you a <laughs> It knows it can't really give you a better product. It's always promising, but if you actually look at its delivery, you really never gotten the goods, have you? No. But it's always, it lives on advertising, basically, because it doesn't really have the goods. So it's got a huge amount of money in its budget to advertise, which is, yes, yes, it, something could be better here. Yes, I don't like this, or whatever. But, so it needs your attention, your attention, to seem real, because there isn't a mental realm that all of us could, could go to the same mental realm. It looks different in, basically, our own little heads, usually, yeah. Like, in my mental realm, maybe next Friday is much more important than next Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. In your mental realm, next Saturday is really important because you're going on a date and you hope this is the one you're going to marry and you'll have kids with and whatever. Yeah? So there's more, the days or the what's not happening tends to seem to be more important by the meaning your head gives. It doesn't have any importance in and of itself, but it... So, oh, that's gonna, this is a really important day that's not happening. <laughs> so, let's think about it now. So, maybe it's like, maybe I can control it so everything that I want to happen in what, that day that's not actually happening will happen. Now, how, how does that work for us? Not well. Um, it says in recovery, any life run on self will, will not be a success. Where does self will really run in the mental realm? If you notice, it really doesn't change the fact that there's seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, touching here. All it does is distract you from that fact, and you get absorbed in that. Why? My view was because we're identified with its main presentation, a self. And so our interest and attention keeps going there, even though we've... That cow hasn't been milked. No milk has come out of it every time you've milked it for year after year. But you still keep holding out that someday I may arrive. Someday it's going to work out. I just, even though I've tried 50 of its formulas and none will work, I bet you the 80th one will work. Well, let me just keep renewing my subscription to that fucking system. It's a failed system. One of the basic, biggest statements in the textbook of recovery is, why are you in fear right now? Isn't it because self-reliance has failed us? So the system of relying on self, which is a total mental system, there is no self here to rely on. There is no relying on self here. This chair is more reliable than a self here. Because at least it's appearing. It's, this is made up. I'm not saying the thoughts are made up. The feeling that you're the one who's thinking that the thoughts is a thought. It is not a clear objective find that you discovered about living. Oh, I am the thinker. No. That's a thought, that you're the thinker. Your thinking is predicated based on the conditioning of the apparatus. Simple as that. The way you were conditioned as this apparatus thinks a certain way. How those thoughts come up is when the apparatus refers to something now into its files and thoughts about that come up. And then you, because you and I are conscious, we see them. Yeah? And if we're really into them, which we are because we believe they're about us, or that we're the thinker of them, we tend to get hyper-conscious of a certain amount of them. Yes? A lot of thoughts we never even notice, but we notice quite a lot of certain thoughts. Usually based on that they tickle a deep belief that your mental process has about the you it's made, which is, let's say, you're not worthy. So when there's an interpretation 
that is implying of a situation that's implying you're not worthy, you may really attend to that. Your attention will go like that, like shit to it. It flies to shit. Because there's a belief there. So you have a belief that you're not worthy. And so when thoughts about being not worthy come up, there's a hypersensitivity to them in the apparatus. The same saying. That's why it talks about old ideas and beliefs. Unless you let go of all your old ideas, the, the result will be nil. You're not going to get out of self to self. It's no fucking way. Yeah. So the self is structured, obviously, with beliefs and old ideas. And the oldest idea of all is that you're a self. That's the oldest one. That was the one. First, I am. Yeah? And then I am a body. Those two were the first locks. And then the mental system spread with those little facts that it made up. Yeah? And of course you say, hey, yeah, I am a body. Every time I've ever thought, I've been right in this body thinking. Every time I ever felt. But it's like the camera head taking itself to be the tripod. <laughs> Just because this is how you're located here by, in a body doesn't mean that's the fucking camera. <laughs> you're thinking, I'm the tripod. I'm the one that's seeing and projecting light. And no, no, no. So yeah, all right, so now you're sucked up in that ass. You're in the mental realm. And of course, there's going to be what? A lot of basic feelings that we experience, or a sense, which is that irritability, restless, and discontent. The mind's agitated because it's thinking. It's not at peace because it's, it's thrust in a role of seeking relief. For what? The idea it has of itself, instead of entertaining true relief by realizing I'm not that. So the mind has become enslaved to this part, this product of a mental process, so it's entertaining everything from that idea of being a self, which limits your ability to entertain unbelievably. You can't entertain being free now. You can entertain only, maybe I'll be free later. That's the best you can do in selfing. Because if there was a recognition of freedom now, there would be, you would see there is no need for a self to get free. There's no need for the self to get any security for me. There's security in enough just being awake. Yeah? So here in that mental realm, you know it, thinking. What's not happening? Let's say three days from now. It's not happening, actually. You cannot stick a Wednesday in this Monday. There's no room for it. All you can do is think about a Wednesday and get so absorbed in the thinking that you forget this Monday and so for all intents and purposes, it's Wednesday to you. And Wednesday to you in the mental realm is going to be a bad day. A lot of shit's going to happen to you on Wednesday. And therefore, what occurs is the feelings about what it would be like to have a really bad day get Injected here because the mind makes up what it thinks it would mean to have a bad day. And then it has an experience in the body of that. And it's a product coming out of what's not happening. There's no cause of it. It's an effectless effect. It has no power to affect you unless you believe in its cause. That's why the solution to me to what's not happening and all the products my mind uh, harvests from that activity, yes, is to entertain it's just not happening. What occurs then is my interest and attention, not my the interest and attention that I've been feeding it goes somewhere else. And maybe I like the product that my interest and attention brings from here to me instead of what it brings from that mental realm of there to me. I tend to really like it a lot though. If something goes wrong here, I usually react, and I, there's some action happens. You can't take an act about next Wednesday. You can do everything you need to do to try to make it okay, but basically the act you're taking over and over again is thinking, and it's not you taking it. And every time you try to think your way out of what's not happening, that's being in what's not happening. Trying to think your way out of what's not happening is being in what's not happening. 
You're in that mental realm, trying to get out of a mental realm. That's why it says self can't get out of self. Why? Because there is no self. If the mental process, let's say we had a box here and all these lights and and it was making noise and everything. And this mental process, this box represented the mental process. And it made up something. And what it makes up is a vague feeling of being a self. Like a long-lasting independent separate entity. So there it goes. It makes up. You could never take that out and take it anywhere away from that box because it's only a product of what's in there. It doesn't have any existence other than in there. You couldn't go, okay, a self has been born, and now it can go into a selfless realm. No way. There is no selfless realm. There is no self, period. But here in the mental process, it wants to get out of it, because it's having a really difficult time living as a self. Look at the bookstores. How many books have you looked, seen that says, how to get into the moment? You'd have to be out of the moment to need a book to get into the moment. You're not out of any moment, ever. Only in your mental realm can it seem like you're out of a moment, because the moment you're out of isn't the moment. It's a mental reproduction of what it thinks the moment is. And to it, it thinks it's, there's an option in a moment that it can be out of it, doesn't it? Where did your real suffering start? When I was a kid, I wasn't, couldn't be doing anything other than I was doing. And that was really incredibly peaceful. Because I had no, I hadn't entertained, there was an option. Yeah. As soon as my mind started entertaining, I don't, I shouldn't be here. And then the denial of what's happening got stronger and stronger. I left this place and I entered that mental realm. And then exquisite suffering can happen in that mental realm, as you well know. Because isn't it funny how many times what, what you really want, you don't have. And it, sound, it seems so real, you'll pine over it and think you've really been deprived. But have you ever been put on a dime when you actually got that thing you were yearning for? And then how long did you really want it? Not that long, usually. You've got to see <laughs> the hopes of all that. Of course it's going to make you want something you don't have. That's where the suffering lies. And what happens is suffering, a lot of attention goes to it. And you give the mental realm its only life, your fucking attention. I've been put on the dime so many times. One of the greatest revelations I had was in a bathtub. I realized I didn't want what I wanted. It was so freaking great, because my whole life was based on not having what I want, in a lot of ways. And then really believing that to be true. What would your experience in a mental way be here if you were living here and you never got what you wanted? You'd be freaking pissed. Yeah? You'd be resenting like a lot of people, as, because they must have stopped me from getting what I wanted. Or turning it on you and getting so into, oh, I'm the reason why. It's like a flood of attention. If that ego or that self was a flower, it would be booming. You'd be watering it and giving it sun all day. It doesn't even matter day or night you're thinking about yourself. <laughs> it's like you've got to tend that God in every moment, every day. And it begs, it demands after a while. Yeah? First it may just sort of ask nicely, but after a while it's just demanding attention. Yeah? You are going to think about what's not happening, if you like it or not. So, I love this message because when I entertained it, it's worked. That's why I love it. I don't love it because it sounds really cool, and I, I love it because it produced something. Not a thing, but it produced a freedom that I could never have conceptualized in selfing. It has nothing to do with any idea of a had of freedom. But it's totally applicable to life as a way to travel life. That's its only value to me. It works. It doesn't need advertising. It doesn't even need much reinforcement. Maybe in the beginning it does. But after a while it reinforces itself. Because the whole advertising budget can be 
cut off because you actually it delivers the goods. Now you're probably very unused. That's a very unusual event for you. You always sort of put on a time delay or waiting, or, or it's be, you would have gotten it, but you didn't do something. It's a, you know, if you would have done something, it would have come. It's always excusing its inability to produce the goods. What happens when something actually produces the goods? All well, that's dismissed. You know it works. Why? Because it works. You don't have to have a blind faith in it or a dogmatic belief in it. You don't have to fake it till you make it. It's true. Yeah? That ability to entertain, which has made something that seems in a... Well, look at what it's made for you. Your ability to entertain can override what's, hap ha what's happening with what's not happening. That is an incredible ability of your attention and interest. If you put your attention and interest on something that's not happening, if you believe it, it can override what's happening. Could you imagine if you put it on what's happening? <laughs> blue becomes blue, red becomes red, yellow is yellow. Things become obvious to you. Yeah? And not to you, but they become obvious. And there's a response or there isn't. There's not much thinking about things anymore. How, many t how much do you... What happened to your natural likes and, and likes since you were a kid when they were shuffled up into the mental realm? Well, when you were a kid, let's say there was a pool there, you'd run and dive right in. Now it's thinking about it. Thinking about everything. What? <laughs> thinking, thinking, thinking. After a while, it's like... It's like a mental constipation. You can't, what, are you, what can you rely on if you're totally relying on what's unreliable? You're going to be a wreck. You're going to be looking for false authorities everywhere. You're going to hope a book saves you or some other group or some other master and shit. Because you're totally lost. You're walking around constantly relying on this. You meet a master, but you rely on your take on him or her. That's not relying on a master. Sounded like my liver communicated. <laughs> I'll get to you later. <laughs> yeah? We're like the blind you know, leading the blind alive. We really are, aren't we? And sometimes we can't even recognize when something works. It gets massaged by thought and it's oh well, it may not work later. <laughs> Fuck. And I you know, I hate to admit it, but in, sometimes in recovery you know, you present something in, in recovery and the way to shut off all investigation is it's not recovery. What the who's the hell is to say what's recovery? <laughs> That's not, you know, what we say. I don't want to say it because I've learned I don't want to say that word, the AA and <laughs> But, you know, I've heard so many people that when you present something that may be incredibly helpful to them if they could open up their... Oh, that's not... So, forget it. <laughs> Come on. You don't have a real, you don't have the luxury to be choosing and, and, and picking your life preserver by the color of it, yeah? You're fucking drowning. It's good to grab it. And then maybe when you're buoyant, hey, then you can check things out. But right now, I would say it's important. <laughs> you get a little buoyancy in your life. And you can, you can actually drown with a life preserver. If, you, if that life preserve, preserve becomes dogmatic and dry and brittle, it gets harder and harder and harder. The more life is taken out of it, it's going to sink you. The thing, when its purpose was to buoyance you. To me, recovery is about freedom. It's not about being right, making others wrong. It's about finding something that truly works so it allows you to be okay <laughs> and have a sense of okayness, a sense of it. A sense of okayness See, most of us don't know that our peace, a lot of the time, is just the absence of a lot of things. And we're not, we don't have much gratitude when something's absent, because our conditioned mind doesn't recognize something that's not here, except what it presents as thought. But a lot of people realize it when, like they, their old song says, you don't know what you got till it's gone. That's exactly right. So people forget what they've gotten because it's just the absence of things, the absence of that insane 
big dog running your life. Yeah? And then they go, oh, well, I think I'm, I'm bored. I'm going to go out and drink tonight. And, and they have this assurance that recovery is going to be just like it's always been. And it may be true, but they're not going to be. Now that thing woke up again. Now the thinking has been charged and generated. You've given it a drop of attention, and it's become a freaking river. Now you believe and you have options. I could, every time you go out to eat, should I have some wine or not? You don't see that's the true loss. It's that insane activity of mind, selfing. I met a man that he worked with, and uh, you know, he called me up and he said he wanted to meet me for lunch. You know, and recovery. And so he met me and he told me he'd been drinking. And he's saying, yeah, it's going pretty well. I haven't been arrested or anything like that. And I said, well, how much thought did you put on about this lunch date? How much did you think about what you were going to say to me? How much? How much freaking obsession around this one thing? And now, how do you do when you go to dinner? Your mind just goes off. Should I have wine or not? Should I do this or not? It takes an option. It t you give it an inch, it will build a whole infrastructure of mile upon mile of highways of thought. All that traffic, there's no peace there. Yeah. But I'm doing fine. I haven't been arrested. That system, that is like one of the last destinations of a consequential level. I mean, the suffering way before that. That's just like, you know, the suffering magnified into an appearance, but the suffering is that agitation, eh? that disquiet in heart and the agitation of the head. It's unfucking bearable. To me, that's the peace. You know, wake up, and that's all that happens. So I wake up. <laughs> that what gets acknowledged. Yeah? Now, there may be thoughts arise, but they also get acknowledged as not me. I don't say it anymore, but I see him as that. And therefore, everything that happens, I'm actually present to it happening. <laughs> you think it's a miraculous feat. It's the easiest thing in the world once you get used to it. The thinking is the incredible gymnastics. Yeah? It is so easy to walk into a room and experience the walking into a room. The thinking about it. What's going to happen tonight? Why, why don't you just fucking find out? <laughs> you know, why do you want to have an insurance policy? Nothing out of the ordinary will happen to me. You're missing all of life. You know? That's what it becomes in a way. You start walking and there's always a stair appears. But the joy isn't that there's always going to be a stair appears. You stop looking down. That's the piece. Yeah? At first, you, you still don't have faith. And maybe 800 stairs appealing will still not convince this head. Because it's not able to be convinced. It can be convinced and unconvinced. But when you abandon yourself, that doesn't, that's not your job anymore. Your job is to look. Yeah. And I've noticed for 20-something years, a stair has appeared underneath my feet. But the joy isn't that. The joy is seen, undisturbed by it. Obsessing over, is a stair going to appear? Yeah. That's the beauty of it. Abandon yourself. What does that mean? You don't have to abandon you. Abandon the self. Abandon it. How do you abandon it? Just maybe, just maybe, start entertaining you're not that. That's a damn good start. And maybe if it's, it's going to be for you or in this life, then you're probably going to have recognition every once in a while that the thoughts aren't about you, really. They're about self. And you're not the thinker of them. And then this little snowball is going to build momentum. And there's going to be a sense of okayness that will come over you that you, your mind will probably not notice because it doesn't see absences, really. But after a while, it will intimate to you, hey, something is really different than it was before. And then, I hope you, for me, I really honored the absence of all those things. That's my temple. Not an altar, but the absence of all altars. The absence of all those things is where I like to worship. Because I remember, by hearing people share, 
the insanity of a disturbed mind. And I know, just like anyone else, there would be no difference in me if that disturbed mind went on long enough, there would be an activity to get loaded, to get relief. It doesn't matter if you're a spiritual giant or a janitor. It doesn't matter at all. It has nothing to do with any spiritual giants. It's just the honoring, yes, an honoring of what is what you would call many, many absences in your life. And then, if you look, you really know the problem by the solution. You'll really see all those things that it's such a joy to have absent in your life were really part and parcel selfing. And there was no way I was ever going to get out of that as a self. That I'm sure of. That's one of the main points I uh, hope to put out here. There really is no way self can get out of self. You can get better strategies to live as one. It can do that. There's plenty of them here. But they tend to take a lot of discipline and a lot of vigilance I don't think most of us have. (laughs) We need an easier, softer way. I really don't. I don't see ourselves signing up for weak intensives every week. And even that's selfing. But if you lose your interest, if your interest and attention can be unbonded to the idea of being a self, which I believe can occur and does occur when you entertain I'm not that. Yeah? Many times when you entertain I'm not that, it will be selfing entertaining it, but every once in a while, the mind will entertain I'm not that. But not as a self, but as the mind. And that's the beginning of freedom. Yeah? And it doesn't take a second for freedom to appear. Because it's already so. And you get a hit, boom. And then something affects you beat deeply. Your mind scurries around, but it can't really sense what went on. But you'll know it over time. You'll, it'll be intimated because you'll travel lighter. And I have a strong belief and a faith in your mind that it really loves traveling lighter. Because now its ability to entertain peace and know the word serenity and all those statements is open. Yeah? Because it was being stopped because everything was entertaining, it was entertaining as a self. See, that's how the system of mind defeats us. Your ability to entertain is still present. Yeah? Your, this, the ability of mind to give meaning to things is still there. But we gave something the meaning that it's us, and now that self is what's distributing all meaning. And that self is what's entertaining. And it severely limits your ability to entertain as a self. You can only entertain everything in time. So peace is something that you'll have to do to get by taking a practice or a process, Yeah. It's always put into time, usually based on you doing something or having something, which is the ultimate play in God. See? So God's, the experience or the sense of God here is based on you sensing it. That to me is the bigger God playing with God, the idea of God, yeah? That's why I don't like, I know why they said it, but for us here, I would love to see us entertain that I want, I have a knowledge of a power greater than myself, of its own understanding. I don't want that, I don't, see, first of all, it's not out there, but I don't want to frame that power with my own understanding, because I will surely, surely diminish its effects on me. (laughs) Unbelievably so. Because this selfing will be playing God with God. So we'll make a little frame and allow a little bit of God to come in every once in a while, but they still be the gatekeeper. No, no, you weren't good today. No God for you. Like the soup Nazi in Seinfeld, you know? No God for you today. You weren't good, but you didn't meditate. And we use beautiful things, let's say, like meditation as a way of binding you to the mental realm. Whatever you come in contact, it will take advantage of In your life, whatever comes in contact with you as this life, that head will come take advantage of it. A great spiritual path, whatever. There's nothing wrong or right with spiritual paths. It's a beautiful way to live, if that's the inclination of your apparatus. But it's not a way to get somewhere. It's a form of, it's a way to express. 
a place you've always been, let's say. So like, let's say in the head we see a saint. And so we see a saint act a certain way. And everyone has given him the proper, you know, proclamation, he's a real, or she's a real saint. So what we do is we try to do what they do and have what they have with the expectation that we'll be like they are. But you don't realize they're not doing anything as a practice. They're doing whatever they're doing as an expression that there's no one doing anything. But immediately our head sees it and tries to make it a discipline. Well, if I, you would not want to do what a lot of quote-unquote masters do. It would blow your whole construction of head. <laughs> really, they're not playing by the mores of society, a lot of them. They're freaking crazy. <laughs> really. There's, you probably wouldn't like them if you spent a lot of time on them. <laughs> they're nice when they're up there and they leave, but I mean, they may not be as nice as you thought when you saw them. But see, there's no way you can put this in a formula. When the mind opens up, it doesn't, you know, it's going to, whatever. All bets are off. Some of them are angry because the conditionality. Of course, they're not angry. That's the point. The apparatus it was an ang- had angry conditioning. They're angry. They, they get they get pissed quickly. But there's no one getting pissed. That's the point. It's not like you get to be really good. <laughs> That's not. It could occur, but it's not a necessity. You just get free from the you know from the ideas of good and bad, from the ideas of being right or wrong from the ideas of how to be a saint and what makes me not a saint. All those ideas lose their power over you. Yeah? So. so if we could just entertain, at least in the beginning, the possibility there is immunity to thought. You can have immunity to thought, but not as a thought. As what you are is the immunity to thought. So let's say we're going to start with, all right, the thought is always going to jump ahead and claim it. So we're going to say, instead of you having immunity to thought, let's just look at what you think you are and entertain it may not be you. We're going in the back door, so to speak. We're not trying to go, yes, you are immunity to thought, because that could be self and going, oh, yes, now I'm immune. No. We're just going to look at what thinks it needs, let's say, immunity to thought. Let's see what that is. If it's not you, that's the immunity to thought, <laughs> literally. <laughs> because if it isn't you, what occurs? The interest and attention that's enslaved to that mental system gets freed. Yeah? Literally. And it, what is your life but where your intent, interest and attention lies? If you're not attentive, do you know anything? No. The interest and attention now, for many of us, are in this, it's been given over to this idea that a mental process manufactured. Because the way, way it was presented was that it's me. And there was an identification with that. And now, the interest and attention is enslaved to honoring who you are. And who you are, as this, is a process called selfing. So most of your attention goes to thought, obviously, because that is the activity of being who you are. You're a fucking thought. Yeah? This is about, what happens if I'm not that thought? My mind may turn away from that and entertain from its own nature, which is not finite, not untrusting, not unreliable, but reliable, infinite, and incredibly trusting, then you know the word serenity and comprehend peace. Then you have a new attitude and a new outlook. Then you have a new idea of what's free, what's happiness, and what's this. Because you're in another realm now. You're not in the mental realm anymore. Not that mental realm. When you're not in that mental realm, you start having immunity to that mental realm because it's presented to you through thought. That's what it does. All of its 
boundaries and borders, all this, of its mental geography is made by old ideas and beliefs and thoughts. It's all it's like a giant cartographer, a map maker. It's made up a whole map about what it thinks life is, and then you're just your attention and interest is on all these highways of thinking and interpreting, traveling, you know, more than 32-hour bus rides, insane bus rides, totally. Oh, I've lost the source of my happiness. 80 hours, maybe years on that trip. Jesus Christ, so there's local trips to hell and then express trips to hell. You're on a bus taking you to hell all day, line of thoughts. Can you imagine entertaining that the source of your happiness has left you and you have no recourse of ever having it again? That would be exquisite suffering, yeah? If a mind that has the ability to entertain was put to that unenviable task to entertain that, it could produce a lot of fucking exquisite suffering. Not because it's true, but because of what's entertaining it. The ability to entertain is unbelievable. To give it such a minor task as that, it's going to go to town. You can create, you can make a, an endless well of suffering for the rest of your life with the unrequited love you had once and then never to have a recourse to, especially let's say if they died in an accident. Oh, your mind can make a huge story about that. The only person I'll ever love, are they around? No, oh, oh, yes. I don't mean, and then you deny everyone else who brings you love in your life. No, you're not that one. Mind's unbelievable. I do not want it to interpret life for me anymore. No fucking way. I had enough of it. I saw the whole beast. I'm older than a lot of you, and I saw the whole beast. It's been presented to me from head to toe. There is no arrival date. The sense of being special is never going to translate into you really feeling happy, joy, and freedom for a while. It's not. It's all a form of slavery so that your attention and interest will keep being given to it with the hopes that one day you'll be great as a self. It's just an incredible extortion racket, really. You just keep giving it your attention and interest, and it just keeps promising you, promising you, or convicting you for you're the reason why nothing happened, or it's because of someone else that it can, you know? What would a faulty system have other than excuses, rationales, and blame? based on its faultiness. If it could deliver the goods, it would need no excuses. It would just deliver the goods. Yeah. It wouldn't have no need to rationalize the absence of something you really wanted because you'd have what you wanted. And it wouldn't have to blame others for thwarting me from getting what I want because you would be in what you want. These are little like cherry blossoms of a failed system. Yes? rationalizations, excuses, blame. But look at it. Has it ever delivered the goods on a long-lasting manner? No. Why would you keep hoping it will? It's about getting off the bus, really, unfortunately. You didn't get off early enough. <laughs> it's like getting off the bus. Let the door close and let it go. doesn't mean recovery, it doesn't mean anything. This is just, I believe recovery has built an incredible pad for us to look past the mental stars. I really have. Now, if you're inclined to go there, it's a damn good thing that you've heard a message that it's possible. If you're not inclined to go there, so what? For me, I was inclined to look there. Thank God I heard a message that confirmed it. Yeah. But it has nothing to do with you have to look there or nothing. It's all that selfing. Whatever is the inclination. Obviously, there's an inclination because you come here to entertain this idea. Let it take its root and see where it takes you. Yeah. It's, all, it's an amazing little ride. I'm really quite uh, enthusiastic still about it. My head, I'll tell you, it was so painful when I was doing drugs, you know. First of all, there was no me ever doing it, but I, I like the flair for the dramatic. <laughs> there was a lot of drug, cocaine taking, and I would stay up seven to ten days a lot of times. And the level of mental suffering 
was supremely fucking unbearable. <laughs> the mental realms of hell are really unbelievable. What can happen if that thing has has all of your power to entertain <laughs> given over to it? It can entertain a really bleak mental landscape, an emotional like desert, and a just totally bankrupt sense of <laughs> total. You know, one time I got arrested. I don't want to. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'll record it. Uh, one, time, one time I got arrested. Um, I had drank. Uh, it was just a boring Tuesday night. Of course, you know how you are. You're just bored as hell. And, a guy, and I was do, drinking some tequila. My girlfriend at the time, this French lady, her mother and her had gone to France, from Mexico, and they brought her a bottle with the worm and everything. So we were just drinking tequila on a Tuesday night. And uh, a friend of mine came over, and he had gotten a glass bottle of liquid acid from his dealer's refrigerator. I don't know if he was taking it or was off giving it. So I said, what the hell? He's got nothing else to do. So I licked some, you know, I took a little hit and I licked it. And I realized I, it wasn't enough. You know, I said, oh, you got to do some more. So I licked it. And you know what happens sometimes? You lick it and just then I knew I had done too much. Yeah? <laughs> but there was no aborting the mission. So I was just ready to buckle up. But I was like, I knew I was going to, it was way overboard. <laughs> so as the night continued, <laughs> I don't want to go into, oh yeah, I will. I'll go into the details. I'm very, really, I very 